Hey guys, this is Kathleen talking about um, lecture today is shock. Um, I want to talk a little bit about shock and um, make sure that you read your chapter in your book on um, shock. And th I love this picture because it really um, depicts traumatic uh, injuries that can cause shock and what a patient actually looks like when they're in shock and you can see that this patient had um, was a victim of the Boston bombing and lost his leg. <clears throat> and you could see how pale he is um, and how they're rushing him to the ED to get him into surgery to stop the bleeding. So the objectives for this is uh, we want to define the different types of shock and the specific treatments and specifically the approach to someone who's hypotensive. So the definition of shock is inadequate oxygen, oxygen delivery to meet needs uh, of cellular and organ needs. This results in global tissue hypoperfusion and it really uh, causes metabolic acidosis. Shock can occur with a normal blood pressure, and hypotension can occur without shock. So remember that you can have someone with normal vital signs and they can be in shock. That is a take home. Uh, understanding shock, what you have is you have inadequate systemic oxygen delivery, which activates the autonomic nervous system to maintain homeostasis. So the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and cortisol levels. This causes overall vasoconstriction, an increase in heart rate, and increase in cardiac contractility. This also stimulates renin angiotensin, and what you get because it's sensing your hypotensive water and sodium conservation and vasoconstriction to restore that volume increase in blood volume, and increase in blood pressure. Cellular, cellular responses um, to decreased oxygen delivery, you get ATP depletion, which causes iron pump dysfunction. You get cellular edema at the cellular level. You get hydrolysis of cellular membranes and cellular death. So what we want to do is to maintain cerebral, your brain, and cardiac perfusion. Vasoconstriction occurs with splenic musculoskeletal renal blood flow. Basically what that is is vasoconstriction to other organs. This leads to systemic metabolic lactic acidosis um, that overcomes the body's compensatory mechanism. So the body's trying to compensate. But what happens is, over time, you get this metabolic lactic acidosis that it overcomes the body's compensatory mechanism. Um, this causes endothelial inflammation and disrupt disruption at the cellular level. You get the inability of O2 delivery to meet demand, and this results in lactic acidosis, which causes cardiovascular insufficiency. And this is an increased metabolic state. It, this this causes increased metabolic demands. The progression of shock causes um, physiological effects and worsening shock where you get cardiac depression, respiratory distress, renal failure, and DIC. So you look at the systems, cardiac depression, respiratory distress, Renal failure, that's another system, and DIC is hematological, and this results in end organ uh, failure. Someone in shock is in the ICU. Um, we do an ABCs, which consists of cardiorespiratory monitoring, pulse oximetry, uh, oxygen. Most, most of the time, these patients are intubated. They have multiple IV accesses. They have central lines, um, Swangans, catheter. Um, ABGs, labs, Foley catheter to actually monitor renal function and vital signs, including rectal temp, which is, gives us a core temp. Physical exam, we're looking at vital signs and mental status. 
Mental status is key. That's a system neurologic. Skin color is another system. Um, the color of the patient, temperature, pulses, looking at vascular, how are they perfusing? perfusing. We go, we're looking at, is this an infectious, is this septic shock that's causing this? So um, <clears throat> do they have a cellulitis? Do they have a pneumonia? Um, in the labs that we, we, we will be obtaining are CBC, chemistries, lactate, coagulation studies, cultures, and ABGs. Further evaluation, you know, are they having trouble with mentation? We most likely might get CT of the head or is this an infection of the sinuses? You know what is going on with this patient. Lumbar puncture can take a look at if they have uh, neurologic functioning. We might do a lumbar puncture to see if there's a bleed or an infection that's causing um, you know neuro deficits. We'll do wound cultures. We'll do acute abdominal series if they're coming in with abdominal pain or we suspect a trauma or any infectious process. We'll obtain an abdominal pelvic CT or ultrasound. We'll check cortisol, le cortisol levels. We also will get fibrogenin, fibrinogen, FDPs, which are fibrin and fibrogen, fibro, fibro, fibro fibrogen degradation product, which stands for FDPs. And this testing is, the FDPs are used to commonly diagnose uh, DIC. The reference range is, you want it less than 10 <clears throat> for FDPs. Approach to shock, patient in shock, recent illness. You know, what's the history? Fever, chest pain, shortness of breath. Have they had abdominal pain? What are their comorbidities? Any new medications or what medications are they on? Did they ingest uh, any toxins or ingestions? Recent, recent hospitalization or surgery? And baseline mental status. The physical exam, we're looking at systems. We're looking at vital signs. CNS, mental status, neurologically, the skin, the color, temp, rashes, sores, any petechia, any bruising. Cardiovascular, we're looking at ju jugular vein dis distension on the necks, on the neck, which helps us to look at preload, heart sounds, um, lung sounds, respiratory rate, oxygen sat, and an ABG will obtain. GI, uh, is there any abdominal pain, any, any rigidity, any guarding, or any rebound on exam? And what is the patient's urine output? <clears throat> Patients in shock look ill. They have altered mental status. They have skin that's cool, mottled, hot, or flushed. They also have weak or absent peripheral pulses. Their systolic blood pressure is usually less than 110 and they're tachycardic. And these are all signs of shock. Do you remember how to quickly estimate blood pressure by pulse? If you have a pulse of 60, if you have <clears throat> a certain pulse, you will have uh, at least a blood pressure of 60. If you have a radial pulse, you have a blood pressure of 70. If you have a femoral pulse, you have a blood pressure of 80. And if you have a popliteal pulse, you have a blood pressure of 90. If you palpate a pulse, you know your systolic blood pressure is at least this number. So if you palpate a pulse in any of these areas, you know that your blood pressure is either at least 90, 80, radial 70, and apical um, pulse, is, your blood pressure is at least 60. Goals of treatment, airway control the work of breathing, 
optimize circulation, assure adequate oxygen delivery, and achieve the endpoints of resuscitation. We determine, does this patient need intubation? And remember that intubation can worsen hypertension. Remember that sedatives can lower blood pressure. Positive pressure ventilation decreases preload. And we may most likely need to volume resuscitate prior to intubation to avoid hemodynamic collapse. And remember that acidosis increases respiratory rate. Um, and that can cause <clears throat> for a compensatory me mechanism after being intubated. And once you're intubated, that can cause you to become unstable as well. Respiratory muscles consume a significant amount of oxygen. Tachypnea can contribute to lactic acidosis. <clears throat> Mechanical ventilation and sedation will decrease the work of breathing and improve survival. To optimize circulation, we're going to give um, crystalloids and we're going to titrate um, the central venous pressure to 8 to 12. That will be our goal. And the urine output will be at least 30 mLs an hour, and hopefully this will improve heart rate. Patients may require four to six liters of fluid and no outcome benefit from colloids. <clears throat> Maintaining oxygen deliver delivery. Um, we want to decrease oxygen demands, so we're going to provide analgesia and anti-anxieties to relax muscles, relax muscles and avoid shivering. We want to maintain arterial oxygen sat, give supplemental oxygen and we want to at least maintain a hemoglobin of greater than 10. We will be getting serial lactate or central venous oxygen saturation to assess tissue oxygen extraction. Uh, SMVOT, which is big S, MVOT is mixed venous oxygen saturation from a pulmonary artery catheter. And then central venous oxygen saturation SCVOC is from a central line. <clears throat> Endpoints of resuscitation, the goal of resuscitation is to maximize survival and minimize morbidity. Use objective hemodynamic and physiological values to guide therapy. So the goal-directed approach is a urine output of greater than 0.5 per mL per kilogram per hour a CVP of 8 to 12, a mean arterial pressure of 65 to 90, and a central venous oxygen concentration of greater than 70%. <clears throat> Persistent hypertension might be due to inadequate volume resuscitation, could be due to pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, hidden, hidden bleeding, adrenal insufficiency, and a medication allergy. So practically speaking, we need to keep one eye on these patients, frequent vital signs, monitor, monitor successive therapies, watch for decompensated shock, let your colleagues know that these patients are sick, and types of shock are hypovolemic, septic, cardiogenic, anaphylactic, neurogenic, and obstructive. So what type of shock is this? You have a 68-year-old male with a history of hypertension, diabetes, presents with the ER with abrupt onset of diffuse abdominal pain, with radiation to his lower back, the patient is hypotensive, tachycardic, a febrile with cool, dry skin. <clears throat> Hypovolemic shock. And you can have non-hemorrhagic shock with hypovolemic, which is due to vomiting, diarrhea, bowel obstruction, pancreatitis, burns, neglect or environmental, i.e. dehydration. Hemorrhagic shock is due to GI bleeding, trauma, massive hemoptysis, AAA rupture, ectopic pregnancy, and postpartum bleeding. So again, with hypovolemic shock, we do the ABCs. We establish two large four IVs or central line. We give crystalloids, either normal saline or lactated ringers, up to three liters. If it's hemorrhagic and they need blood, they're going to do O negative before they're even cross-matched. We can go ahead and give that. We want to control any bleeding and arrange for definitive treatment. 
also we're going to get CBC, ABG, serial lactate, electrolytes, BUN and creatinine, coagulation studies. We're going to type and cross match. And we might be getting these depending on what um, the cause of the shock is, a chest x-ray, a pelvic x-ray, abdominal pelvic CT, chest CT, GI endos endoscopy or bronchoscopy or vascular radiology. <clears throat> These are infusion rates in 18 gauge peripheral IV, 50 ml per minute, and the pressure is uh, about 150. And 8.5 French quarters, 200 ml a minute, 450 ml per minute. What type of shock is this? You have an 81 year old female resident of a nursing home presents to the ED with altered mental status. She's febrile to 39.4 hypotensive with a widened pulse pressure, patient is tachycardic with warm extremities. Example of under the microscope, what that bacteria looks like. Two or more of a systemic inflammatory response. If you have a temp of greater than 38 or less than 36, heart rate greater than 90, a respiratory rate of 90, 20, WBC is greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, plus the presumed exi existence of infection, and remember that the blood pressure can be normal. Remember the definition plus refractory hypotension. After bolus of 20 to 40 mL per kilogram, patient still has one of the following, a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, a MAP of less than 65, uh, and a decrease of 40 millimeters of mercury from baseline of blood pressure. Bloodborne infection, these are some examples of as a, <clears throat> you have sepsis, oops, infection, Sears, SARS, and these are some of the causes, and these are some of the infections, fungal, parasite, could be a virus, could be bacterial and how they all overlap. Pathogenesis of sepsis, you get a systemic inflammatory response, which causes diffuse endothelial disruption and microcirculation defects, which causes global tissue hypoxia and organ dysfunction, which causes severe sepsis, which causes multi-organ dysfunction, and refractory hypotension, which causes septic shock. Clinical signs are hyperthermia or hypothermia, tachycardia, wide pulse pressure, low blood pressure less than 90, and mental status changes. Beware of compensated shock. Blood pressure may be normal. Ancillary studies, cardiac monitor, pulse ox, KEMBG, CMP, coags, uh, liver function test, lipase, UA, arterial blood gas, and serial lactate. Blood cultures times two urine cultures, chest x-ray, and Foley catheter for renal perfusion. Treatment consists of two large bore IVs, normal saline IV fluid bolts, one to two liters wide open, supplemental oxygen, uh, empiric antibiotics based on suspected source as soon as possible. Antibiotic survival correlates with how quickly the correct drug was given. We want to cover gram positive and gram negative bacteria. And that would be Zosin 3.375 grams IV and Septrioxone 1 gram or EpiPenem 1 gram IV. Additional coverage may be indicated for Pseudomonas, which would consist of gento, Gentamicin, Cefepim, uh, MRSA, Isvanco, intra-abdominal or head, neck, anaerobe infections would include, include Clinda or Flagyl. Um, Asplenic uh, is ceftriaxone, which would cover uh, H influenza, and neutropenic cefepime or epipenem. If patient has a persistent hypertension, if no response after two to three liters, then we would start vasopressor, norepi, or dopamine, and titrate to effect. We want the MAP to be greater than 60. If the map is still less, less than 60, 
we want to consider adrenal function and give hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV. <clears throat> this is an old study, but it really has changed um, the way we think about septic shock. They had 263 patients with septic shock by refractory hypertension or lactate criteria. They randomly assigned to end goal directed therapy or to standard resuscitation arms of the study. The control arm treated at clinician's discretion and admitted to the ICU. The early goal directed follow protocol for six hours and then was admitted to the ICU. This was a treatment alg algorithm. For first six hours in ED, more fluid, five liters versus three, more transfusion, 64 versus 18.5, and more WB13 versus 0 0.8. The outcome, 3.8 days less than hospital, two-fold less cardiopulmonary complications, better SVO2, lactate, base deficit, and pH, relative reduction in mortality of 34.4%. And 46.5% of the control had better outcomes versus 30.5% of the... <clears throat> and goal-directed therapy. What type of shock is this? A 55-year-old man with a history of hypertension, diabetes presents with crushing substernal chest pain, diaphoresis, hypertension, tachycardia, and cool, clammy extremities. <clears throat> Cardiogenic. Defined as systolic blood pressure less than 30, cardiac index less than 2.2, and wedge pressure greater than 18. Signs cool, mottled skin, tachypnea, hypotension, altered mental status, narrowed pulse pressure, riles, and murmur. And what are some of the causes of cardiogenic shock? Uh, AMI, sepsis, myocarditis, myocardial con contusion, aortic or mitral stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a genetic heart disease that is common. It's caused by excessive thickening of the heart muscle, referred to as hypertrophy, which occurs most commonly in the septum. And lastly, a acute aortic insufficiency can cause cardiogenic shock. Often, this occurs after ischemia, a loss of left ventricular function, lose 40% of left ventricular ability, and shock occurs. <clears throat> Cardiac output reduction equals lactic acidosis and hypoxia. Stroke volume is reduced. Tachycardia develops as a compensation. Ischemia infraction worsens. Tests that we're going to do, EKG, chest x-ray, CBC, um, complete metabolic panel, cardiac enzymes, coagulation studies, and an echo. Treatment is airway stability, improving myocardial pump function, cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, supplemental oxygen, IV access, intubation will decrease preload and, and result in hypotension. Be prepared to give fluid bolus. <clears throat> so the treatment uh, for an AMI would be aspirin, beta blockers, morphine, and heparin, if no pulmonary edema, IV fluid challenge. If pulmonary edema, dibutamine, dopamine, um, combination therapy may be more effective. Patients most could be going for percutaneous intervention. A stent may need to be placed, or they might require prior thrombolytics. If they have right ventricular infarction, fluid and dibutamine, no nitroglycerin. Acute mitral mitral regurg or ventricular septal defect, we're going to give dibutamine or nitroprusside. We're going to give pressors. And what type of shock is this? You have a 34-year-old presents to the ER after dining at a restaurant. We're shortly after eating the first few bites of her meal. She becomes anxious, diaphoretic, begins wheezing, noted diffuse, puretic, rash, nausea, and sensation of her throat closing off. She's currently hypertensive, tachycardic, and ill pairing. Anaphylactic. A, a severe anaphylaxis is a severe systemic hypersensitivity reaction characterized by multi system involvement. It's IgE mediated. An anaphylactic reaction 
is clinically indistinguishable from anaphylaxis and do, does not require a sensitizing exposure. No, a, a good example of no prior exposure is contrast medium in the CT scan. What are symptoms of anaphylaxis is puritis, flushing, urticaria, which is hives. <clears throat> Next is throat fullness, anxiety, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. And finally, altered mental status, respiratory distress, and circulatory collapse. Risk factors for fatal anaphylaxis is poorly controlled asthma, previous anaphylaxis, And recurrence rates for insect bites are 40 to 60%, 20 to 40% for radiocontrast agents, and 10 to 20% for penicillin. Most common causes of anaphylactic are antibiotics, insects, and food. So patients can have mild localized urticaria, which can progress to full anaphylaxis. Symptoms usually begin within 60 minutes of exposure. Faster the onset of symptoms, the more severe the reaction. <clears throat> Biphasic phenomena occurs in up to 20% of patients. Symptoms return in three to four hours after initial reaction has cleared. A lump in my throat and horse nuts herald life-threatening laryngeal, laryngeal edema. Anaphylactic is a clinical diagnosis defined by airway compromise, hypertension, or involvement of cutaneous respiratory or GI systems. We want to look for exposure to drug, food, or insects, and labs have no role here. ABCs, again, angioedema, respiratory compromise, require immediate intubation. We're going to get an IV. We're going to put them on a monitor, make sure we get their pulse ox. We're going to need IV fluids, oxygen, epinephrine, second line of corticoid steroids, and H histamine blockers. Epinephrine is 0.3 milligrams IM of 1 in 1,000, which is an EpiPen. Repeat every 5 to 10 minutes as needed. Caution with patients taking beta blockers can cause severe hypertension due to unopposed alpha stimulation. For cardiovascular collapse, we're going to give 1 milligram IV of 1 in 10,000, which is on the coat cart, which is light brown epinephrine, which on the box is 1 in 10,000. 1 milligram of epi, if you had to push, it would be 0.1 milligrams, which would equal 1 ml, because it's 0.1 milligrams of, uh, of epinephrine in each ml. We're going to give corticoid steroids, methylprednisone, 125 milligrams IV, prednisone, 60 milligrams PO. We're going to give antihistamines, um, Benadryl, 20 to 25 to 50 milligrams IV, um, histamine blockers, Zantac, bronchodilators, albuterol nebulizer, atrovent nebulizer, magnesium sulfate, 2 grams IV over 20 minutes, and glucagon for patients taking beta blockers with refractory hypertension. Um, that's an antidote to reverse the beta blockers. It's 1 milligram IV every 5 minutes until hypotension resolves. All patients who receive epi should be observed for at least four to six hours. If symptom-free, discharge home. If on beta block or a history of severe reaction pass, consider admission. We have a 41-year-old male presents to the ER after an MVC, complaining of decreased sensation below his waist, and is now hypotensive, bradycardiac with warm extremities. Neurogenic shock occurs after acute spinal cord injury. What happens is sympathetic outflow is disruptive, leaving unopposed vagal tone, which results in hypotension and bradycardia. Spinal shock is a temporary loss of spinal reflex activity below a total or near total, near total spinal cord injury. Not the same as neurogenic shock. The terms are not interchangeable. Loss of sympathetic tone results in warm and dry skin. Shock usually lasts from one to two to three weeks. After injury above T1 can disrupt the entire sympathetic system. Higher injuries equals worse paralysis. With neurogenic shock, remember ABC, remember C spine precautions. Fluid resuscitations keep MAP at 85 to 90 for the first seven days. This is 
thought to minimize secondary cord injury if crystalloid is sufficient, insufficient use vasopressors, search for other causes of hypertension and for bradycardia and treat with atropine or a pacemaker. And just so you know, the MAP is the average pressure in a patient's um, arteries during one cardiac cycle. It's considered the better indicator of perfusion to vital organs. Um, and a MAP is about a map of about 60 is necessary, necessary to perfuse coronary arteries, brain, usually range 70 to 110. The treatment is prednisone, used only for blunt spinal cord injury, high dose therapy for 23 hours, and must be started within 80 hours. It is controversial uh, for risk of infection and or GI bleed. You have a 24 year old male presents at the ED with MVC of chest pain, difficulty breathing, on exam, you know the patient to be tachycardic, hypotensive, hypoxia, and with decreased breath sounds on left. What kind of shock is this? Obstructive. So things that cause obstructive are tension pneumothorax, air is trapped in pleural space with one wave valve, air and pressure builds up, mediastinum shifted, in, shifted impending venous return, Patient has chest pain, choice of breath, decreased breath sounds, no tests needed. Treatment is needle decompression and chest tube. What happens is that you get blood in the pericardial sac, prevents venous return and contraction of heart. It's related to trauma, pericarditis, MI. Patients often will have Beck's triad, which is hypotension, muffled heart sounds, and JVD. Diagnosis via chest x-ray, large heart, echo, and treatment is pericardial synthesis. Pulmonary embolism, reverse cow's triad is hypercoagulable venous injury or venous stasis. Signs, tachypnea, tachycardia, hypoxia. Low risk, we'll do a D-dimer. High risk, CT, CT of the chest or VQ scan. If the, we may want to consider heparin, or thrombolytics at this time. Aortic stenosis, resistance to systolic ejection causes decreased cardiac function. Patients often have chest pain with syncope. They have systolic ejection murmur. This is diagnosed with an echo. They remember that vas vasodilators will drop pressure. Patient most often needs valve surgery. Any questions? That was very, very quick. I'll be available anytime. If you have any specific questions, make sure you read the chapter and review what you need to know uh, on this exam on my courses.